All right, so thank you very much to everybody uh, for joining uh, uh, this talk on real-time machine learning with Python. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting content that we want to uh, go through. We're going to be covering quite a lot of topics as we go through. Uh, so please uh, hold your seats. Uh, it's going to be uh, a very interesting area um, that I would also love to generate the discussion even after the talk, to continue uh, exploring best practices. So um, you can find uh, my Twitter uh, through this uh, link that will be in the corner. I'm going to be publishing the slides and the code uh, 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 later on today. So if you want to get them, you can uh, access it uh, through uh, my Twitter. And my GitHub handle is also the same. You'll be able to access them through there. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I am the engineering director at Selden Technologies uh, and the chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, but uh, primarily, my background is as a practitioner, software engineer, uh, across uh, hands-on and leadership roles. Uh, currently leading a, a, team, a set of teams uh, for uh, 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 open source uh, machine learning. And more specifically, uh, my role at Selden encompasses our uh, uh, open source production machine learning deployment framework uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, we focus primarily in the life cycle of models once they have been trained and uh, all the complexities that come around uh, productionization of machine learning. So a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today, it will involve uh, the best practices that we've identified uh, when performing uh, real-time, uh, as well as uh, just general large-scale uh, machine learning uh, deployment. Um, although today we're also going to be diving a little bit into the, into the training uh, side. And also my role at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. Uh, there, uh, this is a research center that focuses on uh, developing work uh, towards responsible uh, machine learning uh, this is primarily through contributions to ongoing standards, as well as uh, working groups uh, that are working in uh, this, this type of verticals. Uh, recently, one of our uh, contributions was to the Association of, uh, for Computer Machinery, the ACM. Uh, we published a, um, a statement on uh, contract, uh, co contact tracing applications, um, uh, primarily uh, towards the technological implications and best practices so if you want uh, to check it out, please uh, do, and any thoughts are appreciated. And uh, the Institute is also part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're quite excited that a lot of contributions are still in the intersection with open source. Um, but today we're going to dive uh, specifically into a conceptual introduction uh, of stream processing, and just generally streams. Uh, we're going to also be talking about real uh, about machine learning uh, and machine learning in the context of uh, real-time processing, as well as some of the trade-offs across different tools uh, and different frameworks that you can find uh, to be able to to leverage. And we're going to cover a hands-on use case uh, of how to apply all of these uh, things. And as I mentioned, you know, if you have uh, questions as the talk goes on, uh, please ask them on the on the chat. I'm going to be stopping and addressing questions uh, um, as I go to each of the sections of the presentation. Um, so in regards to the use case, we're going to be doing uh, real-time processing on a Reddit dataset. Uh, so uh, Reddit, uh, as we all know, is uh, uh, calls itself the, the front, front page of the internet. So what we have is a dataset uh, of uh, Reddit comments from our science that have been removed uh, by moderators, and we're going to be building a model using this data set. And we're going to be aiming uh, to fix uh, the front page of the internet, because we can all agree that it's not, the internet is not the, 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 the full of just positive stuff, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, we also want to uh, uh, dive into some interesting things that uh, we can see on the exploratory data analysis of this data set. Um, so, of course, we're not going to have time to do all of that, but, you know, after the talk, you can actually dive into some of the um, um, data, data, uh, data uh, exploration on the Jupyter notebooks. Um, but before diving into streaming, we need to take a trip to the past. And, and really, this is not even a trip to the past, because 
uh, this is the present, right? And the present is ETL. What is ETL? Uh, ETL is, as you can see in this architectural diagram, uh, the concept of extract, transform, load. That basically means you take a data set, you do something with it, and then you put it back somewhere else. And this is how um, you know the data processing world has worked since the, the stone, age, stone Age, right? Uh, ultimately, it's not about like you know real time events. It's more about like you know you take a batch, you do something, you put it somewhere else. Uh, the reality is that you know the world still functions this way, but at the same time, you know we're moving more towards this real time thing. But I want to dive into this concept of ETL because it's still so prevalent, and the complexity doesn't only come with this ETL, uh, you know, three letter acronym. Is that you? You not only have ETL, right? You also have ELT. You have EL, you have LT, and you have tons of different uh, types of um, you know combinations of this stuff, right? And the problem is that they all they're not all just um, um, you know terms that people throw away just because they they feel like it. Ultimately, uh, or although sometimes that is the case, we, we all know. But 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 the reality is is that these terms actually do refer to uh, are, uh, patterns uh, of data processing that are present in industry and this separation is still important and there are a, a, a large range of different tools that are available at your disposal for you to be able to leverage each of these different things e e ETL, ELT, EL, ET, la la la, la etc. Uh, of course there's large number of tools that, that you know, are you know useless but uh, a, a, a lot of these different tools you know they are very good, very specifically for certain areas, and you know they're they're best when uh, facing specific uh, uh, challenges, right? And more specifically, you know some of the tools that fall into this, you know, in the context of you know uh, ex extract and load uh, instead of you know transform is things like you know Plume uh, or NiFi, Apache NiFi. Plume basically you know allows you to move data uh, uh, from from different databases. Uh, ultimately, NiFi, as you will see with other tools, it tends to be very ambiguous of the of the of the division. Because, for example, with NiFi, you also um, um, they also leverage a lot of the transform step. Um, so, although it, it is used a lot to move data around, it also can be used for actually transforming it. Now, in the you know extract load transform, that would be more on the data warehousing perspective, right? You load your data to something like Elasticsearch or sort some data warehouse, and once the data is loaded, that's when you actually transform it, right? And then there's there's others like you know ETL, which is the sort of like more common extract transform load, uh, which encompass all of the the different areas, uh, and and these are tools like you know Uzi or Airflow, if you have heard of that. Uh, but today, you know, we're going to be uh, using an old, uh, a good old ETL step where the transform step is the is, is a human with a Jupyter notebook. Right, so that's going to be in in our case our non real time process, and and what we're going to be doing in the context of ETL is going to be the training of our model. And the reason why I'm talking about ETL and and batch is as a step towards this concept of of, of streaming. And the reason why is because batch and streaming ultimately uh, get brought up in the context of you know is it one or the other? When should you bring it? Um, you know when should one be be better than the other? But in reality, what we're starting to see is that, of course, you have some tools that specialize into the streaming world, and you're going to want to be uh, leveraging them uh, in the context of, you know, eventing or real-time processing. Uh, but there is a, a larger and larger intersection of both platforms, sorry, of both uh, um, um, concepts, and even more of an overlap that tools try to uh, uh, unify those. And more specifically, you often find yourself where you actually need both. And today, for example, we're going to be training one model, which is not going to be real time, but then we're going to be actually putting that model in production for stream processing, right? And it's ultimately going back to that massive ecosystem that we were talking about. You know, it's not about just running with a hammer trying to, to find a nail, but it's instead trying to understand what is the right tool for the challenge, right? Um, and then, as I was saying, right now there's this this massive trend within the streaming world uh, to to unify both worlds, batch and streaming. Right? The the streaming community uh, is is trying to bring in this concept that when it comes to stream processing, if you take a batch of data, 
it would be the exact same as if you were just, you know, just streaming that. So if you take a file and you pass it through through a stream processor, that would be still uh, in the same sort of framework that could be uh, used. And at the same time, when you take a real-time stream, let's say, for example, events that are coming out of a system, you may want to also take batches that would be uh, used for processing. And tools like Spark actually do this, where they actually uh, use uh, this concept of micro-batching in their stream processing, where, you know, as you're aware, uh, you know, I'm still going to go into, into detail in case uh, you're not as familiar, uh, uh, um, um, Apache, uh, um, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that technology, what it basically does is uh, it allows you to actually process large scale uh, um, uh, uh, sort of data sets, right? Uh, Apache Spark is able to distribute horizontally that massive data set that may not fit in memory and then process it and get some insight. However, when it comes to uh, Spark streaming, what it basically does is it actually takes uh, chunks of the stream and then sends it uh, to Spark uh, so that it actually processes it in, in micro batch. And the stream community, they basically say, you know, this is not real streaming, right? It's fake streaming, you know, that doesn't count. Uh, I do have to say that in the, in the most recent, uh, on the, in the more recent versions of uh, uh, Spark streaming, they actually introduced uh, the ability to be able to process in actually every single data point as opposed to micro batches. Right, so, so that, that's just one thing to mention. But yeah, what is interesting here is that there is a lot of push towards this convergence of worlds. And we're gonna cover this in, uh, into a little bit more detail in a second. But before diving into that, I, I wanna dive into some of the concepts that are specific into streaming. When you get a stream of data and you actually are processing that data, you have new concepts that um, you know, are quite common in that, in that uh, community, but are important to, to gain as foundation so that when you uh, approach a challenge, you can use those best practices. The first one you have, you know, most probably already come across that is the concept of windows. This is basically the ability to take on a specific window of data points and be able to actually perform a computation uh, uh, that could be a stateful computation across that specific batch, right? So in this case, you can have tumbling windows, which is basically not non-overlapping windows, or you can have sliding windows where basically you actually do overlap on the, on the windows that you gather. And this is, this is where the, the point about the unifying worlds come in, which is basically saying, well, you know, you are dealing with a stream, or you can actually convert that stream, streaming problem in, when it's necessary, of course, not always, into this sort of like micro batch problem specifically when you want to actually gather, perhaps let's say an average across every second, right? Or, or, or something like that. And one of the things that we're gonna cover, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in two slides is specifically the, the concept of, um, you know, the time of the events themselves, right? So you, want, you may want to have the actual sliding windows or tumbling windows on the time that they arrive, but perhaps you may also want to process, uh, the, to, 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 to make these windows on the or original event time, right? Because remember that, like the time that an event arrives is not the same that the time the event was actually generated, right? So perhaps your windows are one second, not on, this, on the time that they arrive, but one second on the actual event time, right? So, and, and this is something important, bear that in mind, because we're gonna actually cover that uh, uh, in, in a couple of slides, and, and that's gonna be an, an important uh, detail. The second point, is the, the, the concept of checkpoints. And checkpoints are basically uh, like how you have it in, in, in a game, right? In a game, you know, when you reach a checkpoint, if suddenly uh, uh, you die later on, you, you return to that checkpoint, right? So in this case, that's the same intuitive concept, uh, not the same, but it's an intuitive way to understand that concept, uh, which is basically that um, you're able to keep track of uh, uh, consumers uh, basically where they were able to actually uh, 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 read last, right? And this is an important concept when it comes to streaming because when you actually have a consumer, you can also have perhaps a consumer group, right? So you may, may have multiple different consumers actually reading from a, 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 um, a, a queue and you may want that the, the checkpoint is for the entire group. Now checkpoints, the other important thing is to understand when you're actually marking that checkpoint. Are you marking that checkpoint on the moment that you read it? Or are you ma marking that checkpoint on the moment that you're actually processing it, 
right? Because ultimately, when it comes to um, um, the, 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 the uh, uh, commitments that you can get uh, when it comes to stream processing, you can actually have things like uh, at, at most one delivery, uh, at least one deliver, uh, at least one's delivery, and uh, exactly one's delivery. And as, 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 as people that have actually uh, worked with uh, streaming uh, processing before, the exactly once is the hardest. And it's, it, it, it's a really hard challenge that, uh, you know, it, it, it has to be reassessed and it has to be, you know, really thought well when, when implemented. There are some data uh, streaming processing frameworks that offer it, um, uh, 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 of course, with some constraints and assumptions that, that need to be in place. Uh, like Apache Kafka that allows you to define these things at, at least once, at most once, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, as, as, as you approach your use case, it's important to, to bear in mind which one to use. And now the, 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 the key other point to cover is the concept of watermarking, right? So we talked about processing time versus event time before. And watermarking basically says, if you're perhaps doing a window uh, uh, computation, say perhaps you want to, to have the, the uh, average of, uh, of some uh, attribute uh, on every second, right? Your, your watermarking is basically saying, how far are you going to be able to wait in regards to holding a buffer uh, for you to be able to count uh, events that arrive late, right? So you're processing on windows, not on processing time, but on event time. If an event that was supposed to come five minutes ago arrives right now if your watermark is still seven minutes or anything above those five minutes then you'll still be able to take that and then bring it to that window recompute the window and have that uh to be able to use as your as as, as your you know window processing so so the concept of watermarking is is an important one primarily as it allows uh for the ability to consider events that, that come later and again you know this is this is a component that that has to be taken into consideration when building your stream processor, et cetera, et cetera. And some frameworks uh, provide it out of the box. Uh, some others, uh, uh, you know, you have to like build it. Some of the tools that are available at your disposal for stream processing include things like Flink, Kafka Streams, Spark Streaming, Post, Python, and Selden, which we're gonna be using in this specific context. But before that, before we actually talk about the processing, we need to talk about what is the thing that is being processed. And for that, we're gonna be talking about the concept of uh, the machine learning workflow. And this basically consists of two basic streams. The first one, which uh, revolves around the training of a model. Basically, you get some data uh, that you want to use for a model to learn from, and you convert it into features that the model can actually read, and then you are able to iteratively uh, 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 train the model until you're happy with that specific model. Once you're happy with the current accuracy or performance metrics, that's where you can deploy the model and the new unseen data can be processed by that model that you have been trained. Specifically in our use case, we're gonna be using the, the, the tool, tool, tool sets of scikit-learn and Spacey. And what we're gonna be doing is taking data set, which is basically Reddit comments and predict whether this would have been moderated by uh, the admins of the page. So what is going to be happening for our model to be able to predict and learn from this data, we're gonna have first the text as it arrives. We're gonna be uh, using a text cleaning uh, component, a tokenizing component, we're, we're gonna see what it means, which is using Spacey, a vectorizer component, and then a logistic regression machine learning model. What does that look like? Well, let's see in more practical terms. If we have a, an input data that says, uh, you are a dummy, what happens is that goes through our text cleaning. As you can see, the first stage removes the symbols. Then it goes to a tokenizer, which is basically using Spacey. This converts the string into actual string tokens, which in this case, it would be pronoun is dumb. And then from that perspective, you pass it through a vectorizer, which basically converts this component into vectors that then the model can learn. And then you can pass it to the model so that it can train that specific model, which in this case, it would be predicting whether it's true, you know, it should have been moderated or false 
it should not have been moderated. So this is basically the pipeline that we have uh, uh, trained. If you're interested on more about this data set and the model, we actually have a Jupyter Notebook uh, that delves into the exploratory data analysis. And this actually has a lot of really interesting insights of the data set that we used. We can delve into that for a little bit more detail. Now, we have a model that we've trained. There's the question of how do we go from either the model weights or the code that we just created into a fully fledged microservice that has a RESTful API or a gRPC API, or in this context, a Kafka API, a Kafka interface, producing metrics, producing logs with all of the components that a microservice would require. And this is where we're gonna be using Selden Core, which is this framework that allows us to convert a piece of you know, code or artifact into a fully fledged microservice. And the, basically the general steps that are involved to actually containerize code is to first encapsulate it with a Python class that has basically an initialization where it loads the, the actual code or the actual model and then a predict function, which is where we actually call our model. All of the input requests that you send are basically the ones that are passed to this function and the, whatever is returned is basically on that microservice API. So ultimately we're able to use the Sylvan utilities to convert this wrapper into a actual Docker image that can then be deployed into the Kubernetes cluster that then can receive uh, REST requests, or in this case, the actual Kafka streaming topics to process from. And if you're curious, you can actually see in the link below is the full example of how to containerize this model, which it's basically a Jupyter notebook that will guide you to do that. The way that we actually build a wrapper, if you remember, we actually trained a couple of models in this wrapper in the initializing method, it actually just loads the pickle or in this case, DIL, it loads the train model that we actually created. And in the predict function, whenever you send a request or whenever a new uh, data point is added into the Kafka topic, then this actually passes all the way through each step of that pipeline. So the text cleaner, the tokenizer, the vectorizer, and the model to actually return a prediction, right? So this is basically building upon all of the different concepts that we touched upon uh, earlier in, in the slides. And now, okay, we have trained our model, we have containerized our model, how do we deploy it, right? So now in this case, we're gonna be looking at what the actual architecture is. And what we're gonna be having is we're gonna be using the Kafka queue with an input topic and an output topic. And as we deploy our Selden model, this Selden model will be able to consume using the Kafka native interface, will be able to consume from the input topic and produce the output into the topic itself. And, you know, again, you can find the third example and last example of how you can actually use the Kafka interface in this notebook. But what we're going to be seeing here is how do we actually deploy this? And with uh, Kubernetes, as you may already be familiar, you're, you deal with the actual YAML definitions. In this case, Selden provides you with a, uh, a YAML. Uh, in this case, it's a custom resource. Here we define the name of our deployment, which is called Reddit Kafka. We actually define that it's using a Kafka protocol. And then we actually specify that it's using the NLP model, that the, the NLP image that we built in the previous slide with the, with the tool sets. And ultimately, we specify how it can talk to the Kafka cluster using the input topic, the output topic, and the brokers. And then finally, you can actually specify that this model is the one that is being used. With Selden, you can actually define complex uh, graphs with multiple nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, we're only using a single node deployment. Once we actually provide that, we're able to then produce uh, 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 some data, in this case, using the Kafka console producer, um, which then as we pass some input uh, text, it would then be going into the input uh, topic. It would go through the actual cell and model, and then it would be produced to the output topic, which in this case, we would be able to uh, visualize using the Kafka console consumer. So in this case, uh, what we're able to actually get is all of the processed data points that have gone 
through them all. And even though right now we actually covered a broad range of different components, uh, all of this is available for you to actually try out in, in different steps, right? So if you're more interested, more on the machine learning side, you're able to delve further into that as opposed to if you're more interested in the deployment side, which, you know, it's all covered. Now, the key thing about this is at scale, right? Being able to scale this, this architecture horizontally and vertically. As you know, Kafka can actually scale in regards to number of brokers that allows for massive throughputs. And then similarly with Selden, it allows for horizontal scalability, which means that you can have multiple replicas that have a consumer group that then all are actually ingesting from the input topic and then ensuring that if one of the broker uh, uh, um, uh, you know, dies, then you have the different brokers. If one of the actual microservices dies, then you have the multiple different uh, brokers with the with the consumer group. So again, this is very much a high level overview of the intuition, but you can delve into some of the examples that are provided in all of the, the links uh, below. And just as a reminder, uh, the, the slides are available on this link, bit.ly slash sell and Kafka. And these are the, um, the, the slides that will also contain the links for you to be able to access all of the examples. Now, with that said, today we co covered a conceptual introduction to stream processing. Um, you know, we delved into the machine learning model and the training. Uh, we, we covered some of the tools available, and then we delved into both the containerization and the deployment of the Kafka pipeline. And with that said, uh, thank you very much for everybody that uh, joined this talk. And I look forward to taking questions. Uh, if anything, you know, you can, um, uh, you know, feel free to contact or reach out as I would be more than happy to provide any insights. And uh, as I mentioned, all of these examples are open source together with the projects, the underlying projects. So if you think of any potential improvements or anything that is in your mind, feel free to open an issue on the respective uh, GitHub repositories. And again, thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Uh, uh, looking forward uh, to delve further into the discussion.